Yo, what's up, everybody? I'm Bob Walters. This is Locked Up Sports. We have a very special episode for you here today. Welcome inside the Brian Gunzel Studios as we have, like I said, a special episode. The Knicks, the Knicks lost last night by 20. Um, listen, the, the Rangers, 10-game win streak going for more. We're going to talk about all that coming up this week. Uh, listen, the Knicks, don't be worried about the Knicks, all right? When the Celtics shoot like they did last night, it looked like the Villanova 85 team, and they're unbeatable. So no, nobody's going to beat anybody when they're shooting threes like that, the clip of like 70, 80%. So that's just not going to happen. Um, to today's episode, first, I want to I wanna thank the World Podcast Network, as we have had our now our fourth episode that has been selected as a staff favorite at the World Podcast Network, and thank you to whoever is, somebody over there is a fan of ours, and, and keep selecting our episodes, and we appreciate it, and whoever you are, thank you very much. Hopefully, it's like four people, right? Hopefully, it's four different people, and they just all of the ep- all of the show, but we it's our fourth episode that has been selected for a staff favorite. It's a big deal, I guess, in the podcast network. I've, that's what I'm told, so we're happy to announce that. Um, now to today's episode, we got, a spe- like I said, a special episode for you. We're getting into the March. The conference tournaments are just over a week away. The Big East tournament. I sat down just two days ago with Mr. Villanova, Chuck Everson. He's from Long Island. He went to Brentwood High School. He was on the 85 championship Villanova team. The the team, the, the true Cinderella, the lowest seed to ever win the tournament. They're still the lowest seed to ever win the tournament. They were an eight seed. They, they were a nine-point underdog in the game to Villanova with Patrick Ewing, a defending champions that year, and nobody gave him a chance, and they played the perfect game. Like I said, they shot pretty much like the Celtics did last night against the Knicks. They shot like almost 80%. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great interview. Um, he was a great guest. He's, he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. I, I've seen him around the garden for years, and I, I talked talk to him about this, and I've I've always wanted to talk to him about the the game and that team and and Roly Massimino and everything and I I actually went back and watched the whole game the eighty five the 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 championship game against Georgetown I watched the whole game and it was great it's a great game if you ever get a chance you know when you got nothing to do for a couple hours to so, you know pop it on on YouTube and and and, and check it out because it, it's a great game uh, it was the last year with no shot clock it was the first year that there were sixty four teams so we get into all that. And, you know, I don't want to waste any more time, so let's get right into the interview. Here he is, Mr. Villanova, Chuck Everson. Enjoy it, everybody. So now we are joined by our special guest here today. Uh, he played for Villanova from 82 to 86. He stands seven foot tall, or seven one, depending on where you look. He hails from Brentwood High School, number 41, Chuck Everson. Chuck, thanks for joining the show. Absolutely. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, we were just talking here before... Yeah. I was telling him how I, I went back and I watched the 85 championship game and, and how different of a game it was and how good it was. And and it was great to hear, you know, Musburger and Billy Packer and everything like that. I love the NCAA tournament. I love the yeah. Big East tournament. Um, tell us a little bit how you ended up uh, going to Villanova and stuff like that. Well, I, you know, as you said, I'm from Brentwood. Uh, I went to Brentwood High School, played there. Um and I would go to camps because back then there was really no AAU to get, you know, where you'd go to get seen. Uh, so I would go to these basketball camps, Easton Invitational, uh, and then Coach Massimino had a camp in, uh, in the Poconos, which was a big camp. And you'd look up and there'd be hundreds of coaches sitting around watching everybody play. So I went to um, Massimino's camp in uh, in the Poconos and, um, and I heard him speak. And something resonated with me where I, I came home. This was in eighth grade going into my ninth grade year. And I came back home and I told my dad that uh, I wanted to play for that guy. So he basically said, uh, you know, you better start working because those guys are pretty good. So <laughs> um, we so at, so what happened was when you go to that camp, they have an extra help session. And so that was at 7 a.m. So there was no... Um, you know, alarm clocks really, you know, you didn't bring an alarm clock with you to camp and there was no, um, uh, you know, cell phones or anything. So you had to just get up and, and, you know, get there. If you wanted to have extra help, there was nobody there waking you up. And I showed up every morning and coach mass and, uh, Mitch Bonaguro, who was the assistant, uh, 
uh, that recruited me, they were driving around every morning to see who was there. And I, I was a fixture. I was there every day. Some days I was by myself. Some days they had eight or ten guys. And then they uh, they grabbed a hold of my high school coach, Marty Rigger, and said, okay, we want to get this guy. He's working, he's working his tail off. So – you know, we want that guy on our team, and that's how it started. Wow. So you so you were a gym rat is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, well, you have to be if you want to be any good. I mean, that you know, and especially when you're of, of size, you know, there's a lot of things you got to work on other than, you know, handling the ball and stuff like that, you know, coordination stuff, jumping, agility, speed and agility stuff. It was all of that kind of stuff that was going on too. Now, long I, I used to jump rope like a boxer. You know, I would, you know, really? I – I could cross and everything. Oh yeah, man! So, <laughs> double, double dutch. I, I got really, I got really good. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, now, Long Island, it's not exactly a hotbed for for basketball. I know I'm from Sayville, and we were we were always terrible right. in basketball. But it's uh, it's not exactly a hotbed. Did you did you dominate? Were you did you win a bunch of awards? I, I mean, you obviously, won awards in high school and stuff. But well, back then, back then it, it was it was really good. There was a lot of good players on Long Island back then. Yeah, okay. Everybody had one of these studs, you know. So it was. If we were playing Sachem, we weren't playing Sachem. We were playing Eric Wilkerson and Tommy Schreier, or we were playing Alex Agudio at Walt Whitman, or we were playing the Stephen Twins at Lindenhurst. There were some really good players there, and then, you know, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't um, you know any kind of domination or anything like that, like what you were talking about. It was you know it was a lot of guys that could really play, and it was really really good basketball. Basketball now, for a number of reasons, has been watered down a little bit. And one of the reasons is because kids play everything, you know, and so you don't get really good at one thing. You get pretty good at a lot of things, you know. Do you, so I just really played basketball. I see now. Do you, do you, do you, uh, like gear? Do you think people should be gearing the kids towards one sport if they, I mean, if they're talented at it? Because I've always heard that even from, from all athletes, that it's better to just have them have yeah. a broad, you know, have them play all sports. And, you know, they'll be good at what they're good at. Yeah, I mean, I agree. My kids played a bunch of things uh, growing up, and everybody starts with soccer. That seems yeah. to be everybody's first sport now. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's a good thing for to develop, you know, an athleticism, you know. I mean, because if you're using the same muscles over and over again, it stands to reason that, you know, eventually something's going to give out. Um, when you're playing – soccer or baseball and then you switch to basketball or football you're using different muscles and everything's getting you know uh, movement and and work yeah, in so it's funny because my I, to that degree i think it's good okay yeah i got you and, and it's funny because my generation was really the first generation where everybody played soccer you know and we're still terrible for some right. reason but my, i remember my father coaching my soccer team and he didn't even know how to set them up he set us up like hockey He's like, I'll just say, yeah, you know, I, didn't, I don't even know. He's like, I don't know. I, I never, I never watched soccer because before my generation, no one really watched soccer. But so now you—that was me. They asked for a volunteer, and I got an elbow <laughs> in the ribs, and my hand went up. I, I was the soccer coach. You know? <laughs> I was like, hey, That's funny. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, now you go to Villanova. You're playing in the heyday of the Big East. You know, you got, you got the the year you guys won the title. Three Big East teams made it to the Final Four. What was it like playing in that yeah. Big East? Oh, it was it, it, you had to be on your A game uh, every every single night. You know, it was go hard or go home. You know, if you had an off day and you weren't, you at least had to be aggressive and uh, you know and and go as hard as possible. You know, it's one thing to make or miss shots, but you know you had to at least be aggressive and uh, and get after. Because if you didn't, you'd get smacked right in the mouth, literally. You know, yeah. You, you played Georgetown; they throw the ball up. The Georgetown guys. Everybody fouls a guy. They can only call one, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's how it starts. You know, it's it's very physical brand of basketball, and um, I wouldn't change playing there uh, for anything. I mean, I, I love that style of play uh, versus what we have today, where you can't even breathe on somebody. Yeah, you know? I mean, so it's it, a little it, different. It was a whole different. It's a whole different. I mean, the Big East has been, you know, it's gone through a transition. It almost, you know, this is a yeah. new Big East now. Is it's a basketball. It's basically because you lost all the teams, all the schools that had football programs. They all went, you know, to the ACC and stuff like that, and they rebranded it. But I think yeah. they've done an excellent job with it. I, I think this is good. Ba it's good basketball. It's not the original. Nothing will ever yeah. be the Big East that you played in. Let's be real. Nothing will ever be that again. Right. But they did what they could, and they got a good. They got a good. Uh, 
a good league there. Oh, and- it's a good thing. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it's it's a good conference. I mean, you got three teams uh, in the top 15 all year long. Uh, you got a couple other teams knocking on the door to get in the top 20. So I mean it it it's it's a competitive league without a doubt and and it you know it's secular too it it changes like the top dogs are not always the top dogs yeah, except right Saint now except St. John's except St. John's never does anything. is literally the top dogs yeah <laughs> right <laughs> now that 85 team you 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 would you were called the true the the true Cinderella you're still the lowest seed to ever as an 8 seed still the lowest seed to ever win the tournament it, we were just talking before it was yep. the it's the first tournament that went that expanded from 53 to 64 teams it's also the last one without a shot clock now right you guys you guys made it to the final final four you were an eight seed you almost got picked off in the first round you played a bunch of tight games georgetown a team like georgetown they blew out a bunch of those a bunch of on their way to the final four do you think that helped you guys when you were playing them the fact that you played tight um, games in the tournament I, I I think what helped more was playing in the Big East Conference, uh, and, you know, and we were not uh, intimidated or afraid of Georgetown. We had played them twice that year. Took them we the overtime. A bunch of times. Yeah. And, and uh, so, I mean, we weren't afraid of those guys. You know, part of playing when you play in the Big East is when you're playing a, a team outside the conference, especially when you're playing the Georgetown Hoyas, okay? You're not ready for that type of intensity. I mean, they're 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 playing 94 feet. They're pressuring you. They're physical. They rough you up. And as soon as you try to get physical back, they knock you right on your rear end. You know, it's it's not even close. It's it, you know. So we were ready for that type of pressure and everything. So we didn't have that wasn't an issue for us. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, some teams it gives you a problem, but I I you know to to get back to your question, I mean. The first game of that tournament was one of the toughest ones because we actually played Dayton, who was the nine seed, on their home court. You know, so it was uh, it was challenging to say the least. And and Coach Massimino was not happy when the listen when we weren't sure we were going to get in the tournament. You know, because nobody realized that they went to sixty four teams. Which at is, that point. that's crazy to me so that they didn't even know. Nine, we had no idea because what happened was we got blown out by Pittsburgh the last game of the season, and then we had to turn around and beat them three days later in the uh, in the Big, Big East, East tournament. tournament, which we did. And then we wind up losing to St. John's. So now we 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 thought we were squarely on the bubble. You know, we're we gonna get in, or we not gonna get in, and we're we're sweating it out, waiting to hear our name. We see our names up there where everybody went crazy, started screaming and yelling, and everybody said, "Wait a minute, now we got to go to their home court and play them too." <laughs> okay, well. No, it was one of those. Well, you know? and, hey, listen, an eight seed is always a bubble team. You know, you're always kind of right, right there on the bubble yeah. if you're getting that eight seed. But so you beat Dayton on their court. Then you went and beat number one, a, a one seed, Michigan. Uh, yeah, Michigan. You beat them by four points. Then you had in the Sweet Sixteen, you had Maryland. You beat them by three points. So you guys were, you guys were just hanging on and, and and beating, winning close games, which is which is a sign of a good team. Yeah. You know, the, the the committee got it right with you guys at least putting you in. Let's let's you prove them right. Um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah that's good. for sure. Yeah. I, I, we won the whole thing. Yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I know okay. talking about, we played tremendous defense on those teams. You know, Lenny bias was the man back then. And, uh, we held him to eight points when we played them. Yeah. And one earlier the, that year, he had 32 against us. Wow. You know? Okay. Well, so, he was a great player. We held him. To eight. Eddie, Eddie guarded, Eddie guarded him for the most part. And everybody doubled down from other different angles and stuff. And we, we did a tremendous job on him, and we did a great job of stopping uh, Roy Tarpley and some of the guys from uh, from Michigan. You know, so it was um, the defense got us through the games. And what would happen before each game, Coach Mass would put the keys to the game on the on the whiteboard. You know, and um, he'd always put a score. Uh, you know, if we hold them to this many points, we win the game. And we were always under the number that he put up on the board. You know. Yeah, so now, that was a big he, thing. He he looks he was he was a great coach as well. And now when I was watching yeah. the game, a couple couple of things I noticed when I was watching the game, which they call it the perfect game. You guys I think it was 22 of 28 yeah. from the field, right? But you guys, yeah. I mean, you guys, I think that the number was 17 turnovers. 
Every yep, just what I right. what I noticed by watching the game was you guys were either scoring the basketball or you were throwing it or you were turning it over. And to me, it was it was crazy. It was crazy to watch. And and you you also they also you guys had a couple you had a couple chances to put them away in that in the last two minutes. I'd say you missed uh, what's his, what's his name uh, with the crazy. He has a terrible form, but he hit every free oh, throw. Clay, Clay McClain. McClain, 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 yeah. He missed the front end. Yeah. You guys missed on back-to-back trips. You missed the front end of a one-and-one. One. Kind of let them back in the game a little bit. But then, you, again, your defense play, hung tight. And the thing I didn't understand was, how did, was there not a technical foul call? When the, when the Georgetown guy punches the ball into the 10th row just to stop the clock with two seconds? And that's a great question. We had no idea. Listen. They did anything. They were so desperate. They did anything to stop the clock. That's what to it give was. themselves a chance to win. That was anything. And, that, and, and you know what? That was, that was smart. Bad. It was a smart basketball IQ, punching it in the stands. The other thing they did is when we were taking the ball out of bounds, Horace Broadnax hugged Harold Presley and fell backwards and pulled Prez on top of him and trying to get the referee to call a charge because there was no instant replay back then, you know? For, you know, they weren't looking at uh, re looking at uh, plays and stuff like that. But uh, so that didn't work uh, for them. So they punched it into the stands. Yeah, I found myself screaming at the TV because I was like, not only did he do that, <laughs> which is an absurd, absurd play not to get it, not to get a technical foul. On, but they had been warned yeah. about it earlier in the half about doing the exact oh, same yeah. thing. Because Billy Packer on yep. the telecast, he makes a comment about how you guys were up uh you were up five points with 10 seconds left. So the game was over because back then the clock runs on the inbound. So all yeah. you had to do was have two five second violations and, the, and you run the clock out. Even if they score, they right. no three point line, they can't catch up to you. So it, it was just fascinating watching the wheels turn. And then like my wheels started turning. And like I said, I started screaming at the TV like it was happening, you know, live or something. <laughs> um, now what, yeah. now you got, now tell us the story about you getting, smacked in the face at the end of the half and how that might have propelled you guys into the second half and the comeback and, and, and winning the game. Well, um, Patrick slam dunk three shots in a row, bang, bang, bang. And coach mass looks down the bench and says, uh, go give Ed a break. I went, now you're going to put me in the guy just threw three down in a row. <laughs> so I go in and, uh, and, and um, they let us hold the ball. Why? I don't know to this day. I've talked to guys on that team. They don't know why uh, to this day. So um, we held the ball a little bit and uh, got a good shot. Uh, it missed. I tipped it up. Prez uh, grabbed it and put it in. And now they're racing down the floor. Dave Wingate is flying down the court, and I'm ahead of Reggie Williams. And um, I put a, glean, a, a good, clean, hard box out on him. And the reason I know it was a good, clean, hard box out is because I didn't want to incur the wrath of Coach Massimino if Reggie somehow tipped the ball in, and now we go down one instead of being up one at halftime. So he comes up. He didn't like that too much because it was it was physical. And he comes up and he pushes me and kind of half slaps me in the face and keeps running. So now I'm pissed because I want to shoot the one and one so that, you know, I, I get a chance to score in the championship game because I'm, I'm not coming in in the second half if Ed doesn't get hurt or sick or something, which none of us wanted Ed to get hurt at all. Um, I know I, I'm not really going to play unless he's in major foul trouble, he fouls out or something. Um, so we cross in the locker room. We come out behind our bench. First of all, there's a very famous um shot of coach mass pumping his fist and charging into the locker room i've seen it I've you know seen it. and um yeah and we crossed but in the back so their locker room was behind our bench ours was behind their bench so when we walk in there we have to walk by them and they're all like yeah this is we got this no big deal so we i sit down and uh it, it, he rips his coat and tie off and starts saying they're not going to disrespect chuck they're not going to disrespect us we got to go and everybody got revved up. We didn't even get a sip of water, and we were ready to go back out and play. And then the wild thing to me was um, we shoot nine for ten in the second half, okay? That's crazy. We win the game. We win the game. We I go back to the locker room, and I got 30 to 40 reporters around me. I'm going, <laughs> what the hell do you, want to talk, what do you want to talk to me about, man? I played three and a half minutes. What do you want to talk to me about? Well, what happened with Reggie and, you know, and they gave me um, – they, they said that that was the turning point of the game, you know, and if that didn't happen, we don't win, that kind of stuff. And I've 
I've been milking that now. It's coming up on 40 years. I got a lot of juice out of that. <laughs> hey, you know, good work. My out. Of marketing degree came in handy, you know. But uh, yeah, so, and, I, and I've heard yeah. and I've heard a lot of things. I've I, I've I've watched a lot of things with you in it. I, I watch your podcast and everything. Yeah, and I've I've heard just you're kind of the glue that keeps the, the team together, and and you're still very active yeah. in the Villanova uh, basketball community. And and you you were good buddies with with Jay Wright. Who, who's is he a Long Island guy? I know he coached coached at Hofstra, but is he a Long Island guy? No, he's a, he's actually a Philly guy, but he coached at Hofstra, yes, so he yeah. lived on Long Island. Yeah, he was great. Years. He was yeah. great, great coach at Hofstra, and he ends up now. Now your team is is immortalized. There's a there's a uh, a poster or something of you guys right a painting on the wall, right that the the yeah. the Nova team has to walk past. Do you do you think that? Uh, what has been the the state? Why have you guys stand the test of time? Even though we, there's been great Villanova teams now, Jay Wright had some great teams. He's won some championships. They had the the buzzer beater. Yeah. You guys seem to have uh, stand the test of time, though. Why is that? Is that because of the first? You always remember your first. That's the first thing I'll tell you, right? <laughs> and uh, and not only not only that, but I think um, there was kind of a magic about those guys on that team. I mean, when they come around, first of all, there's no jerks on the whole team. You know, everybody's nice. So if you come up to anybody and ask them a question or wanted to take a picture or just wanted an autograph or whatever, it, it's never an issue. And they're all great ambassadors for the university, not just the basketball program. And uh, that's what makes it fun, you know, and it's nice to be remembered. And it's been, shoot, it's, uh, 31 years before we won another one. And uh, and the funny thing was we were really close with the 16 and the 18 teams because back then when Jay was running the show, I would go to practice, uh, I'd say four or five times a year at least. Whenever I was in town, I'd stop and practice. And the guys would all come over and say hello to us. And I, I used to text a lot with Danny Oshefu and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm – I'm on good terms with uh, Ryan and Chris Jenkins and Josh and Jalen and all those guys. And, and, and whenever they see us, they come over and say hello. And even when we, back then when they were at practice, they'd come off the court and say, Hey, thanks for coming to see us play. So there was kind of a special kind of vibe about those guys. And I'm not sure what it was or what it is, but it's still there today. I mean, even the, even the kids that are on campus today kind of know who we are. Like they, if there's a if there's more than one or two of us, they know that we're on campus. You know, it's it's gotcha. weird how that works. I don't. Well, you know, you know? Thing, thing, things spread yeah. in college campuses. It's like it's like high school oh, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, too, you know. Oh so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you yeah, yeah, yeah. and for some reason that there's a there's a million, there's a ton of Villanova alumni in New York. I mean, you got you guys take over the garden a lot of times. You got you and UConn and Syracuse used to do it too. But Villanova, there's a ton of alumni. That, that that packed that building yeah. on on the Big East tournament, and you've even taken over the Knicks. Let's be real, right? Yeah, you, you, you guys are basically the Knicks yeah, at this point. Yeah, the Knicks. Yep. <laughs> are you are you? Do you talk to Brunson or or, or any of those guys or Divincenzo? Yeah, when I see them, I mean, you know, uh, Jalen's great, and all three of them are, are really good guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, Josh and Jalen, I I know a little more than Dante, but um, you know, Jalen's been on the show. You know, we've had him on. We talk with him and. Uh, I, and I've told all my – I'm in a text group with a couple of friends that are big Knicks fans, and, and they were all complaining when, when they signed Jalen. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. This guy's going to be a superstar. They're going to love him here. It's going to be a year or two, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. Yeah. I watched him when he was in Dallas. I'd watch him. I'd watch all – I follow all the Villanova It makes guys. sense. So makes I, sense. I would watch, watch Jalen. In fact, Jalen got me tickets to a game when I was in Dallas – I called him and I was and I went to a game and, um, you know, so he's that kind of guy. And I and I saw him every year. We have a thing called Summer Jam and the current players play against the guys that are in the league or playing overseas. And they have like a little scrimmage and all the rest of the alumni sit around the court. and We watch and tell stories and laugh and joke around and watch the current team play. And uh, and one summer he went from being the best guy in court on the court to being the best guy on the court, you know, just took a jump. Uh, he, he was a step faster, a step stronger, you know, and uh, now you're seeing the results. And I said, what the heck did you do? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, I went to work. I worked. I said, okay, so keep doing what you're doing. You know, so it's, it's working out obviously. Now, what are your thoughts on like the NIL and these guys getting money and the transfer portal and everything, the craziness that is college sports these days? 
I, I think it's changed and it's never going to go back to the way it was. Oh, it's never uh, going back. Absolutely not. Know, when, no, it's never going back to the way it was. I mean, as far as certain things, I mean, guys are – some guys are, are um, worried more about their brand. And now you have, um, quote, unquote, free agency with, uh, you know, the portal, you know. Everybody's why, a free agent every you know, year. The whole th- everybody's yeah, a free agent well, every year. You even have to be there. Yeah, you can you can leave in the middle of the season. <laughs> it's crazy. Play for somebody else. It's crazy. crazy. Yeah, it is so crazy. I don't know. They got to they got to get a handle on it and have some kind of rules to it. I mean, and listen, everybody was all in favor for the kids getting paid, but nobody thought they'd be getting paid the way they're getting paid. Yeah, I mean, well, it's 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 crazy. But you, you had know? to figure some of them um, would, right? They these are big stars, like the the football players, college football players are big stars, like yeah. almost like NFL players. And same goes for basketball. They make a lot of money just being in the v- the video games and stuff. I remember when I was a kid, I used to have Bill Walsh college football or NCAA ba- right. video video game, and it would be somebody who looked right. like you. It'd be a seven foot center, you know. And, but well, that's what happened with this. That's how this whole thing started, you know. Because yeah. Ed O'Banion from UCLA, listen. I, I I was playing video games back then. I go, wait a minute, that guy looks familiar. It's me, you know. And when they had our Villanova team, they had our '85 team in there, you know. So yeah. and I and I got something in the mail for a class action suit. I'm like, what's the? I mean, what are we going to get? A dollar ninety five? I said I I didn't even fill the thing out. And then, boom, he wins the thing, and now it's look at what's going on. It's uh, you know, but they should have had some kind of rules. It, it's the wild wild west it is. because. Oh, there, you know, especially when you talk about um, football on a, on a major, on a high level. I mean, you know, you got kids that are playing at school, and all of a sudden they're getting a call. For something. They're not them, but their people at home are getting a call, and uh, they're saying, "Well, what what's Joey make uh, at school A? Well, we'll give him we'll give him uh, twice that if you come to us." Yeah. You know, so get in the portal, and we'll give you. And some, you know, of the- but there's. There's benefits and there's and there's you know listen it trickles all the way down to high school kids because now some kids are are not getting scholarships because why would I take a 17 year or 18 year old kid when I could take a 21 year old kid who's got two years experience in in playing college basketball and he'll fill that role just as well as this kid. Would. That's a good point too. And they're you also know? they're also telling kids, hey, you're going to get this much if you come to this school, come to our school, come play for us. Then they go there and it's not like they signed the contract, so then they don't get it. And then the kid, you know, it's it's a whole, like you said, it's the Wild West. And, and I think they will a million, reel it a million in. Problems, man. You know, hey, what about this thing? This was something that I, you know, and it, and it's turned out to be, um, it happened at the beginning, but not so much anymore. Because I don't even know what these guys do to earn the money. They just go play basketball or do they have to like. A lot of it's goes boosters. Do public appearances. Or do, well, yeah. So now, so now what's happening is, you know, you had a guy that's, um, now let's say you and I were on the same team. You're the starter, mm-hmm. and I'm our backup. Or Obvi- I put my social media <laughs> game. My, yeah, my social media game is better than yours. So there'd be what well, all your boys would go home and say, "Why? Why is Everson getting paid more than you? You start, he don't start." You know, it, it and it, cre- it creates rifts and who's getting paid what, and you know it, now and on top of that, these kids don't know how to handle money. Oh uh, yeah, you know, and you know, and some of these guys. This is going to be their biggest payday that they get in their lives, because whether they go to work or they go play basketball someplace doesn't mean that they're going to get uh, big money. You know, I mean that's that's just the way it is. And it, it was kind of I, like you it's said, it's all, a lot of it's boosters that are the, you know they, they're just paying the players, and, and a lot of it was also going on even back in your day. Oh, you come come work for my car wash, and I'll pay you you know a thousand dollars an hour. Right. You know, right. and then and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, well, you know, you made a point. So you made a point. So with these boosters, like, what are they getting out of this? Nothing. So they're now rich what people. If, they're if, rich, they're if rich guys, guys. What if the guys paying me five hundred thousand dollars to play and I'm terrible? What are, what are they going to do to tell him? Get rid of that. Kid? He's, a, he's a Villanova fan and he's worth millions. Right. He's a, because boosters, you know, boosters are, are all the regular. Oh, I'm not, I know. You know, it's not the regular guy know, on the street. I mean, that's listen, a booster. I know. I'm not in the practice of just throwing even even if though I'm not a millionaire, I'm not in I'm not in the practice of just throwing my money away willy nilly. You know, you, you gotta get something for your money. I'll tell you what, I'm a Mets you know? fan. I'm a Mets fan. I'd pay a lot of money and I'm not rich at all. There's just oh, to, 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 <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of money I'd pay that I don't even have. I'm a civil servant, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, now, what now? When you see teams like uh, like Butler or or George Mason or Chicago Loyola Chicago, are you rooting against them in the Final Four? 
Because you want to still be the, the, the lowest seed? If they, if they get to the final four and they're higher than an eight seed, yes. You know? Okay. I think I forget who was in it last year. There was, there was a team in there that got really close. It might have been San Diego State. I might, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, what about Butler? Butler, Butler had a half-court shot. Butler had a half-court shot right. against Duke that hit the, hit the glass and, and rimmed out. I know. I mean. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But so yeah. The, the short answer is yes. We okay. all root against that because that – that's a night. Nice, listen, we've had that record now forty years. You know that's pretty good. Oh, you know, I don't. Same I don't blame thing you. with the, uh, the shooting. The shooting percentage too. I don't. Seventy eight point six. We shot. Yeah. And you it? know who came in second to that? Who? Who? Villanova in uh, Villanova came has first and second in that because of the uh, the sixteen team shot like seventy seven percent. When I saw the numbers so and I heard points. and I heard them call it the perfect game and I saw the numbers to it reminded me now I think you're a Giants fan right it reminded me of Phil Sims in Super Bowl twenty one who went twenty two of twenty five and they call that the perfect game. Yeah. You know right. just the numbers right. you guys were twenty two of twenty eight he was twenty two of twenty five. Now what what um why did Jay Wright retire? He he's a young guy he seemed to have a lot more in him I don't think he really like I mean does he like television is he is that what he's going to do going forward? Um, yes and no. I, you know, I think, I think he got a little bit burnt out. Uh, he'd been doing it for a while and it, you, you got to understand there's a lot more to it than X's and O's, especially now when you mentioned the NIL and the portal. So in other words, if you have a kid back when I was playing and you recruited me and I was on your team, I was on your team for four years. Okay. Unless something drastic happened and then I transferred, but you had to sit out a year. Yes. Okay. But I was basically on your team for four years. You didn't have to keep recruiting me. They got to keep recruiting these guys so that they don't leave in the middle of the year or leave at the end of the year. Because now you don't know what you got, you know, going forward. And he saw it's no coincidence that um, Jay Williams uh, and, and Coach K. All retired within this basically the same calendar. Even Saban, year, even you know, Saban walked year. away. Yeah, even Saban, Saban walked too. away. You know, it's, it, you're right. They and, don't want to deal with it. If you're an older guy, if you're an older guy, not that Jay's an old guy, but if you're an older guy, it, it, this NIL stuff is for as a young uh, man, man's game because <laughs> they there's ways to make money that we would never have thought of, and you know when we we were doing our thing. You what know, do you? Th- it's it, it's totally different. What do you know? think about Kyle Neptune? You know, when Kyle, um, when it was announced that he was coming, every one of us to a man said, that's the guy we want for the job. Um, and I think, you know, there's growing pains. You got to remember, he was only a head coach for one year, and that was at uh, Fordham. And then he came over here, and he's following a legend, uh, a Hall of Famer. There's a lot of things, but I see I, I see it gradually starting to change. And I, you know what the biggest though is when you bring five brand new guys in from the portal okay and you got to teach them see at villanova the culture is this the older guys teach the younger guys and then when that younger guy becomes an older guy he teaches the younger guys and so on and so on and i learned from a guy named john panone and michael mulquin and then i taught a guy like mark plansky then plansky taught gary massey then gary massey taught you know whoever and we go down the road you know but they don't have that. I said, because Justin, um, Justin's been hurt. He hasn't even practiced every day with between his knee mm-hmm. and his Achilles. You know, so so there's nobody teaching Mark uh, Armstrong. You got four guys who are very talented guys that came in off the portal, but no one's taught them the culture. And so the guys that have done it, and like myself and everything, and we're sitting there watching this going, wait a minute, why isn't, because no one's told them that that's how it is, and it's it's difficult. It, in other words, it's easier to grasp when you're talking to somebody who's been there and has done that on the floor in the uniform, not a guy wearing a jacket and tie on the sideline. Yes, that's important. Don't get me wrong, but it's when you hear it, you know, in real talk from a guy that has done it, it's different, and and you pick up on it, and there's a lot to it. It's not just. You know, there's a lot to it. And Kyle, I I see I see improvement every game um, from these guys. And sometimes they fall down. But I was at the um, the Butler game the other night, and uh, I thought they played well. I think they got a challenge uh, against UConn coming up on Saturday, and uh, 
we'll see we'll see what happens there. Hopefully they can hang on and get a couple of W's. But for the most part, I mean everybody um everybody is is uh has been understanding and has been, you know, has been in, in his corner um as much as we can be, you know. I mean, you're coming out of a dynasty. And listen, you're, this team this year with, with Villanova, that was a good win against Butler. You're right on the bubble, right where your team was. They're looking at like maybe in an uh, eight or nine yeah. seed or maybe out right on the bubble. So you never know. And, and nobody knows yeah. better than you that, that you never know. Now, do you think they make the tournament this year? I hope so. I mean, they, their, their last few games, they got, uh, they got Georgetown, Connecticut, Providence, Seton Hall, and... One well, Creighton, maybe I'm not sure. One uh, there's another one. Providence and uh, Georgetown, you have no problem with. I don't know if we have no problem with Providence. Providence. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not Providence. I'm, that's exactly that's Providence, what I'm talking about. I'm Providence still thinking is at, Providence is at Providence. Seton okay. Hall, Georgetown, at Seton Hall, and you are at UConn. So you know we got Georgetown at home, and uh, there's another one. I can't think of the game. And you're going to be playing but, on that first day. It looks like right in the Big East tournament. That first, right the first, now, first day. I think that the, 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 today. I think we made it to Thursday. I don't think we're playing. Wednesday. Okay, okay. <laughs> you don't want to play Wednesday. Wednesday's the worst. No, you don't want to play kind of Wednesday. Like no, especially when you got teams that's, getting a double yeah, buy. That's yeah, exactly. You know, and it's hard you know, because it, you're playing back to back to back to back. You know, that's not easy. That's why when UConn did that year, with the, that two years, two, two different times. That was amazing. UConn made that run, those two runs, that, those two runs that they made to the title. I mean, yep. it's just incredible. It's incredible what amazing. they did. Yep. yep I and, and like I said, it's not, the, it's not the Big East that you played in because that will never get that back. But it, it, they did a good job with it, with putting the league together. I think it's got a good future. Sure. And you, you got, you got your, you know, you're right there. I see you every, I'm glad I'm talking to you now, finally, because now when I see you at the tournament, I can go up and say hello to you. Yeah. That I that I that I see you there every year. I'm like, this guy's gotta be a player, right? I'm like, this guy's seven yeah. feet tall. And and, so, yeah. and I sat next to a Villanova guy one year and he told and he told me, he told me who you were in the story and everything. Yeah. And and I watched your podcast. His podcast is called Big East Rewind. His name is yep. Chuck Everson. He's from the True Cinderella 85 Villanova Wildcats, the championship team. Chuck, I appreciate you giving you give me a couple minutes and I'll see you. I'm probably gonna be there Wednesday or Thursday this year at the Big East tournament. Well, we'll be there, and uh, we're doing a little bit of a uh, a meet and greet thing with some former Big East players from all the different teams. Eric Murdoch, who played at Providence, has put this thing together, and we're going to be meeting at the uh, landmark. Uh, 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 oh, the, the Land Shark, uh, Land Shark Bar and Grill at in in Times Square. I was there uh, yesterday. The Land- yep, and uh, we're going to be there at six o'clock on the fourteenth till ten. In and out. Everybody's welcome. There'll be a lot of former players there and uh, former coaches and also uh, Big East fans from all different teams. It, it'll be a lot of fun to catch up with everybody. That's 6 o'clock on the 14th, you said? Yep. I'll I'll text all you right. the, uh, the flyer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Put- I will, yep. I will. The Land Shark Grill, you're also in our Facebook group, so you, you, know, you can put it up there, too. I'll put it up there. Yep. I, you know, I'm going to stop. I'm going to try and stop by there. Say hello. So thanks for giving us a couple of minutes here. I appreciate it. I appreciate Absolutely. everything you do you do for the, for the for the Big East, and thank you. All right, man. Thanks for having me. How about that? How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Chuck Everson. Uh, I can't can't thank him enough. That was a that was a great great conversation we had. I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, some just some fascinating stuff coming out of it. Uh, one that. They didn't know that they would that that the tournament had been expanded to sixty four teams that year. How, to me, how do you not know that, right? How do you not know that that it's going to be sixty four teams this year instead of fifty three like it's been the last couple of years? But apparently, they didn't know. They were all gathered together. That they, they, they didn't think they were going to get in. They lost the regular season uh, finale to Pittsburgh. They basically, you know, they were on the bubble. They were probably they were one of the last four in, I would imagine. You know, if it's today's type of conversations and with the analysis going on today, they were probably one of the last four in. That's usually what an eight or nine seed is. It's usually not a mid-major. Those are, those are lower seeds, the eight or nine. I also thought it was fascinating that when teams like Butler, Chicago Loyola, or George Mason make it to the Final Four, everyone in America – is rooting for those teams to win, right? Everybody except the teams, the other three teams in the final four. And 
apparently now Villanova, the 85 Villanova team. They, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the, the dolphins, the 72 dolphins, like how they pop the champagne and celebrate every time the last undefeated team in the, in the season in the NFL loses a game. So fascinating stuff. I want to thank Chuck Everson again for coming on, for giving us a couple minutes. Uh, I'm going to go, ch- I'll be at that, that, uh, the thing at the land shark that he's talking about. So if you want to go down there, you catch me down there. We're going to have a good time there. The Big East tournament is next week, I guess, right? It's it's a week from this coming Wednesday. So we're getting right into championship week, and then it's, bam, right into the NCAA tournament. Brackets, we'll have our bracket challenge. And, you know, we got the trophy coming again. Drew has it now. Drew has last year's the inaugural one. This year, who will win it? Getting our bracket pool. That's coming up in a couple weeks. And then right after that, it's it's uh it's opening day, and then we're you know before you know it, it'll be summer. So we made it. It looks like we just about made it from the end of the Super Bowl to March Madness. As the weather will, it's cold out there now, but the weather's gonna start getting good again. Thank you to the World Podcast Network for selecting uh, our episode, the fourth episode, to be selected as a staff favorite. This one is uh, it's the one. It's it's tight. It's Mark Mancini is in it. It's titled um. Goalie controversy on Broadway. It's it's a it was towards the beginning of the Rangers now ten game win streak when we kind of just start getting quick. Where it, it was, are we going to have a goalie controversy? Turns out, just starting got everything fixed. Right now, they they've won ten in a row and they're looking like every bit the cup contender. So we're going to get into all that Knicks, Rangers, and everything later this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode again. Thank you to Mister Villanova, Chuck Everson. We'll talk to you later this week, everybody. S- I'm by.